Credo che non mi abbiate sentito, allora ricomincio. Buonasera a tutti, eh, benvenuti a questa serata sul il giorno dopo le elezioni americane. In realtà non abbiamo ancora capito bene se è ancora il giorno dopo, se già il giorno dopo, se siamo ancora eh, nelle elezioni americane. Eh, saluto in particolar modo tutti gli alunni e eh, soprattutto gli studenti della scuola che da oggi purtroppo eh, seguiranno per un po' di tempo le... Um, online e do anche il benvenuto uh, a tutti gli ospiti che sono qui con noi questa sera e alle persone che partecipano dopo lo speech di Ale Cross alla alla nostra tavola rotonda il professor Romano Prodi, Monica Maggioni, Fernando Napolitano e do anche il benvenuto a Mike Plummer che è il direttore della Bologna Center della Johns Hopkins University che è qui con noi questa sera. Um, darei subito la parola al Rettore eh, Francesco Bertini che è anche Presidente di Bologna Business School per uh, un saluto di benvenuto e poi eh, così io mi limiterò un po' a... Um, dare la parola e aiutare forse a tenere un pochino i tempi, ricordo che dopo l'intervento eh, di Ale Cross interverranno i discussant, quindi le persone che ho appena presentato e poi ci sarà anche un po' di spazio per le domande che vi preghiamo di inviare eh, sulla chat secondo le istruzioni che avete ricevuto. Ehm, guardiamo così, cerchiamo di mantenerci in contatto e di continuare la nostra attività grazie alle tecnologie Penso che questa sia una fortuna nel, così, nel periodo anche eh, sfortunato che viviamo, eh, però è anche una fortuna il fatto che abbiamo a disposizione questo strumento che ci consente in un modo diverso dal, dal modo abituale, perché noi siamo abituati a stare insieme, a passare anche fisicamente dei tempi insieme, però ci consente di continuare la nostra relazione, la vita della nostra community e anche essere in contatto con tutti quelli che non sono fisicamente a Bologna. Quindi eh, benvenuti a tutti, buonasera e do la parola immediatamente a Rettore Bertini. Grazie, Grazie. Buonasera. Buonasera. buonasera, è un piacere per me. Mi scusate, avevo un ritorno. Eh, dicevo buonasera a tutte e a tutti. Eh, è un grande piacere per me aprire, eh, portarvi il saluto all'inizio di, di questo evento, anche se mi sarebbe piaciuto molto di più eh, poter essere insieme in una grande sala come eh, l'Aula Magna di Santa Lucia o l'Aula Absidale. Non è stato possibile, eh, come diceva il DIN, eh, comunque, le tecnologie ci permettono comunque di andare avanti e in questo senso eh, siamo fortunati. Volevo ringraziare anch'io eh, i nostri ospiti e in particolare un saluto caloroso a, ad Alec Ross che non solo tiene lo speech di oggi ma e anche nostro visiting in un anno eh, così complicato quindi un ringraziamento doppio a lui il nostro partner Johns Hopkins eh, e, e un saluto eh, speciale a tutti quelli che sono collegati ma soprattutto alle nostre studentesse ai nostri studenti e agli alunni della scuola eh, io mh, non dirò non entrerò nel merito del, del giorno dopo delle elezioni, eh, ma volevo sfruttare questo saluto per eh, rivolgere un, veramente un mio sentito ringraziamento, eh, penso a nome mio e anche di tutta la comunità che rappresento sia come Business School che come eh, Università di Bologna, eh, alla nostra scuola, alla nostra business school, intendo al personale, alla faculty, alle studentesse e agli studenti, eh, per la capacità che hanno mostrato e stanno mostrando eh, di reazione in una situazione tanto complicata come quella che stiamo vivendo. 
eh, una capacità di reazione eh, in termini appunto di rapidità eh, ma anche di qualità della reazione che, sta, che, che la scuola sta mettendo in campo e non soltanto seppure importantissimo nella continuità con standard elevati di qualità della nostra offerta formativa eh, ma anche con una serie di iniziative varie come quella di oggi che dimostrano attenzione anche a quella parte dal mio punto di vista estremamente rilevante che è il mantenimento di quel senso di comunità che è la cosa che manca di più eh, che le tecnologie non, ries non riescono a supplire alla la parte relazionale però eventi come quello di oggi o altre iniziative che la scuola ha portato avanti e porterà avanti contribuiscono comunque a mantenere insieme eh, la nostra comunità anche in momenti come quello che attraversiamo dove la situazione dell'emergenza si è fatta eh, più dura e, e in ultimo per la capacità di eh, non subire semplicemente eh, l'emergenza e quindi reagire all'emergenza ma continuare a guardare avanti, a guardare oltre l'emergenza sia come proposte formative nuove che rispondano alle esigenze dell'emergenza, programmi come BBS React o eh, alla portare avanti quel grande progetto che è l'ampliamento della sede eh, che è stato da poco deliberato, è un programma estremamente ambizioso partito eh, prima dell'emergenza, mi sembra un'epoca fa eh, però eh, la scuola ha mantenuto la determinazione di andare avanti a guardare al dopo e questo credo che l'evento di oggi in qualche modo secondo me è anche questo eh, chiudo con un'ultima sono molto curioso di sentire eh, Alec il tuo speech oggi e anche la tavola rotonda eh, vivevamo in un'epoca e uso volutamente il passato che era già eh, complessa perché attraversata da, da trasformazioni profonde legate al processo tecnologico, alla quarta rivoluzione industriale, alla spinta del digitale, alla carenza di punti di riferimento. No? E questa, questa, questa fase già complicata di per sé, inedita, è stata travolta dall'emergenza sanitaria in questo contesto, eh, cioè quindi in, in un'epoca dove ci sono paradossi come è l'epoca dell'informazione disponibile e, e nello stesso tempo eh, ci troviamo a combattere le fake news. No? In tutto questo oggi discutiamo di un passaggio molto rilevante, non solo eh, per gli Stati Uniti, ma ovviamente per l'assetto geopolitico. Eh, e quindi io non farò nessun commento, aspetto di capirne qualcosa dai vostri interventi. Vi, ri, vi ringrazio tutti eh, per essere qui con noi oggi. Buonasera a tutti, eh, grazie al Rettore Magnifico, grazie a Massimo Bergami, il nostro Dean. Eh, devo dire all'inizio, mi dispiace di non parlare in italiano, eh, Italia è mio... Italia è il mio secondo paese, ho un'anima italiana, però per questo speech che su questi temi non voglio sbagliare troppo, quindi tornerò a parlare in inglese, mi dispiace. Uh, let me say two words before I begin speaking about the election about uh, Bologna Business School, the convener of this event. I'm speaking to you in the grotto of Villa Guasta Villani, a 16th century villa which is now at the heart of instruction of Bologna Business School. And for those of you who are new to Bologna Business School and who are maybe tuning in because of this event, I hope you'll choose to learn more. I decided to move for this academic year from the United States to Bologna in large part because this institution does a brilliant job of taking the very best of the past, drawing from the world's oldest university now led by uh, the rector who you just heard from and has created a business education uh, that draws from that past, even my speaking in a 16th century villa, but with eyes and instruction on the future. 
So I, thank you all for tuning in, uh, not just to hear about the election, but also I hope you have the opportunity to learn a little bit about this fine institution. Uh, so let's now turn to the election. I should say at the very beginning, uh, if you're wondering, I'm not wearing this orange tie uh, in some way to sort of as a shout out or support to Donald Trump. I'm wearing an orange tie because it in fact is the color of Bologna Business School. So don't draw any wrong conclusions from that. Uh, if Umberto Eco were here, he might be trying to interpret the symbolism of the orange tie. No, it's the symbol, it's the color of the school. <laughs> So what do we know? What do we know? It's, it's Thursday evening Italy time and we are going to be together for a little bit more than an hour together and during this hour it's projected that a few more states may report their results uh, and so we are literally living a little bit of history together. What do we know without analysis? Three basic facts. Number one, uh, we have not announced a new president of the United States yet. The election may have taken place on Tuesday, but the counts will not be final for several more days. The media is projecting right now that there is about an 85% to 90% probability that when the votes are all counted, Biden will win. That has not been legally decided yet. So in my own remarks, in my own observations, I'm not going to speak as though Biden is the winner. I'm going to speak as though more contrasting the possibility, even the likelihood of a Biden administration, but juxtaposing it with what a second Trump mandate might look like as well. Another thing that we know, there was no blue wave. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, this concept of the blue wave, un, un onda azzurra, is this idea that blue, the color of the Democratic Party, might sweep over uh, the White House the Senate and take over all of the Congress, that in the midst of a health crisis with COVID, in the midst of some criticisms of Donald Trump for his behavior, uh, that perhaps the American people would call for a big change, would push far to the left and there would be a, bit, a blue wave. This is what most of the media anticipated. This is what the sondaggi, the polls anticipated. This did not happen. In fact, we have a very close presidential race. It now appears as though the Senate will likely be controlled by the Republicans. Uh, and it appears as though the Republicans actually gain seats in the lower house. So there was no blue wave. The third thing that we know is that even after the last votes are counted, it's quite likely that there's gonna be some period of time. It may be days, it may be weeks where things are fought in the courts. Uh, Donald Trump has already filed lawsuits in four states. In some states he wants votes counted, in other states he wants the counting stopped. It depends, not surprisingly, on where he thinks the Republican votes are. But it, we are now gonna go from a test of democracy to a test of the judicial system. And we will see how neatly that goes. Uh, for some of our university students, you might have been very young, you might, have been, you, you might have been babies in 2000 when this happened last, when Al Gore and George W. Bush uh, came together in an election that was so closely fought that it ended up in the courts. It's an open question right now. Do we have a process that draws out for months like it hap like happened 20 years ago? Or does the judicial system handle this in a matter of just a few days? So with my remaining time, what I wanna do, I wanna make nine predictions. Most of my predictions and most of my analysis are gonna focus on economics. You know, my, my, I'm not a political scientist. I don't wanna talk about the horse race or which state is doing this and, or which electoral group is doing that. I wanna try to elevate briefly. Let's try to take things up a little bit and let's focus a little bit on the, on some of the cultural dimensions and some of the economic dimensions uh, of what's gonna happen. First, let me focus on the very short term. Uh, I believe, and I'm very sorry to predict this, but it is a prediction, that regardless of who is elected president, there will be violent protests that follow. If, as, as could happen with still a 10 to 15% chance of Donald Trump winning, if Donald Trump does win, 
I anticipate that within hours of that announcement, America's cities unfortunately will be filled with protesters and those protests will turn violent, especially when law enforcement and if the military is called in. If Joe Biden wins, I still think that there will be protests and I think that those protests could turn violent, but the nature of the protests will be different. If Trump wins, the protests will be in the city and they will happen very quickly. If Biden wins, I think we will see more militia-like activity where men with guns occupy squares, uh, particularly in the state capitals, as we saw in Michigan a few months ago. Unfortunately, there's no happy ending to this story. The United States is a very, very deeply divided country. And unfortunately, whoever wins, the other half of the electorate is going to largely see the victor as a sort of illegitimate president, as a king who stole the crown. Second prediction I would make is 76 days. There are 76 days between today and the time that the next president puts one hand on the Bible and raises another hand and swears the oath of office. There's a 76-day transition period between now and then. I worked for Barack Obama on his presidential transition. It is a wild time. It is a time of a lot of change. It's a time of a lot of disruption. And it, my prediction is that these next 76 days are going to be wild, especially if, as is anticipated, Biden is named the winner in the next two or three days. Donald Trump, I predict, will use everything in his power. And make no mistake, the President of the United States has a lot of power. He will do everything in his power during these next 76 days to shape the world, to shape America, and to shape government as much as he can using all of the power of the presidency for 76 days. So I think, it's gonna, I think there's going to be some, a little bit of chaos. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I think we can anticipate a very difficult, unstable next 76 days uh, until the next president raises his hand uh, and takes the oath of office. Uh, next, prediction number three. Whoever wins is going to have a very difficult time governing. Uh, a lot of what was anticipated with a blue wave was that a Biden administration, if there were a Biden administration, would be able to do lots of very different aggressive policy making. It would be able to completely reshape policy in areas as varied as energy, to taxes, to infrastructure. What we're seeing right now though is with a divided government, with a Congress largely controlled by uh, Republicans in the Senate, with a narrow margin in the House and with the possibility of, of a Democratic president, we will see only a, a marginal things that can get done largely as a matter of executive action as opposed to legislation. So we're going to see the power of the presidency significantly constrained because whoever wins, he will not come in with a big mandate. And what's more, because of the degree to which America is now very divided, it's not in a compromising mindset. I don't see grand deals being done between the leaders of the two parties. And so this takes me to my fourth prediction. For any of you who own stocks, you might have noticed that the last couple days have seen your stock prices go boom. The markets have shot up. In all of this uncertainty, uh, stock prices are going through the roof. Why is that? How is that? The reason for that goes back to my previous point. Uh, with divided government, what the, American pe what the American people have basically voted for in a manner of speaking is incrementalism. Nothing bold. With the Republicans in the Senate, if that is what happens, and with a Democrat in the White House, if that is what happens, then the reason why we've seen these markets boom in the last two or three days is because of taxes. Uh, Joe Biden promised to raise taxes, uh, not that much for highest earners, from 37% to 39%. 
but he had promised much more aggressive tax increases for corporations and in capital gains. What the stock market is saying right now is that because there's a divided government, that kind of tax, those kinds of tax changes that would be extremely redistributive are not going to happen. What this means is a very practical matter is that business is, as usual means a low tax environment for the wealthy and for corporations. And this is why despite all of the chaos in America's politics right now, we have seen equity markets shoot way up in the last few days. Next, prediction number five has to do with energy policy. Energy policy is one of the biggest differences between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Donald Trump is a champion of coal, oil, and gas. And he doesn't really believe in climate change. By contrast, Joe Biden, who doesn't really have that much history in energy policy, he has fully embraced uh, a climate change agenda and um, an investment in renewables championed by more of the left wing of the Democratic Party. And so what now is the consequence of what happened with this election, with what appears to be divided government? Well, if Donald Trump wins, we will see a continuation of uh, energy policy rooted in coal, oil, and gas, as we've seen the last four years. The United States will stay out of the Paris Climate Accords. If Joe Biden wins, as, as looks probable right now, Joe Biden will be able to do certain things with the executive power of the presidency. You, will, you can expect the United States to immediately re-enter the Paris Climate Accords. You can expect some regulation, which makes it easier uh, to support renewable energy and more difficult to do oil, gas, and coal extraction. But the idea of a Green New Deal, sort of the big, bold, you know, investment of hundreds of billions of dollars that I think would have happened with a blue wave, now I think is not going to happen. The Green New Deal, the mother of whom uh, in the United States is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the father of whom you could say is Bernie Sanders. With divided government, we will not see hundreds of billions of dollars going into a Green New Deal. We will see the Biden administration push more toward renewables, but it will not have the power to radically reorient energy policy because of the divided government. Uh, number six, the scorecard for economic and market performance. Donald Trump, as you may know, for those of you who follow Donald Trump on Twitter, Donald Trump evaluates his effectiveness based on the stock market. Uh, whenever people question the, his economic performance, he immediately goes to the Dow Jones. He points to how well people's retirements are count. Stock prices equal the measure of economic success for Donald Trump. And I think that that's been reflected uh, in the stock market. The stock market has had a booming last four years. Even in 2020, a year where you would think in, amidst COVID markets would tank, what we've seen is a huge recovery. Why? It's because Fed policy and other instruments, the formal policy of the Trump administration, has done everything in its power uh, to ensure that markets remain strong. What I anticipate with if there is a Biden administration is a pretty significant shift here. It's not that Joe Biden wants markets to go down. It's that I believe he will measure his effectiveness on economic policy differently. He will measure his effectiveness on economic policy on measures like unemployment. Is the unemployment rate going up or down? Median wages. Are median wages going up or down? Inequality. Is inequality going up or down? So the scorecard for a Trump administration has really been the performance of stock markets. I think if Biden wins, we will see the performance. What Biden personally holds himself accountable for will be much more rooted in measures of inequality, median wages, and unemployment. Uh, my seventh prediction is about three things that won't change. 
We know there are all these differences between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, but I actually think that there will be three areas of very minimal changes. Number one, a stimulus bill. Everybody has been waiting for a stimulus bill of anywhere from half a trillion dollars on the low side to maybe two trillion dollars if there were a blue wave. Regardless of whether Biden wins, regardless of whether Trump wins, I do think that there is going to be a very large stimulus bill that gets passed. Uh, the nature of it will vary a little bit uh, depending on whether it's Biden or whether it's Trump. But I think the, di the differences will only be marginal. Uh, the second thing that where I think we will see few to no differences between a Trump administration and a Biden administration is on monetary policy. Uh, for the last four years, Donald Trump has really pounded the Fed to get monetary rates as close to zero as possible and to ensure liquidity in corporate debt markets to the maximum extent possible. I anticipate that a Biden administration for the next several years would largely look like a Trump administration in terms of that monetary policy. The third policy, the third area where, where I actually think that there aren't going to be much differences has to do with big tech. Uh, in a year, 2020, where Democrats and Republicans haven't been able to agree about just about anything, what's, one thing that's interesting that has really coalesced in the last six months is the hostility to a lot of America's big technology companies. And by that, I'm thinking of Alphabet, I'm thinking of Facebook, I'm thinking of Amazon to a degree. Sometimes companies like Microsoft and Netflix get lumped into this. But I really think that with some of the major technology platforms, uh, we can expect whether it is a Democrat in Biden or a Republican in Trump, I think we can see some significant regulatory action and antitrust action against American big tech. American big tech has made the argument that if you regulate it, if you try to break it up, it just advantages the Chinese companies. I think that that argument has failed to be sufficiently persuasive to both Democrats and Republicans uh, to get them to take their eyes off of them. Uh, among these big tech companies, the two I think that are at greatest risk are Alphabet and Facebook. Not, even though these companies get lopped together a lot of the time, I think those are the two that really have the gun sights of both political parties on them. And just by way of illustration, about two weeks ago, the Trump administration began an antitrust proceeding against Alphabet. I do not think that a Biden administration will call that off. If anything, I think Biden will just push it harder. So stimulus bill, monetary policy, and uh, an increasing scrutiny of big tech, uh, I think that those are three things in common. Uh, number eight, prediction number eight, Europe and Italy. Uh, I think that one of the big differences between a, Tr a Trump second mandate and a Biden first mandate would be its orientation toward Europe. Uh, I think that Donald Trump has much more of an affinity with Eastern Europe than he does with Western Europe. He's a fan of Kaczynski. He's a fan of Orban in Hungary. He's a fan of Putin. Two of his wives were even born in Eastern Europe. Uh, contrasted with that is I think he has a really hard time with Western Europe. He, he has not demonstrated much of an affinity, in my opinion, for Western Europe. And I do believe that if there were a second Trump mandate, it's terrible to say it, but I do believe he would eventually pull the United States out of NATO. I do believe that some of the kinds of trade practices that we saw a Trump administration engage in with China, I do believe he would begin to impose those on Europe. He, he views trade policy as something that can be weaponized. Uh, by contrast, I think a Biden administration will almost want to step back in time. It's going to try its very hardest to pretend like the last four years never happened. I anticipate that there would be a trip very early to London, to Brussels, to Berlin, hopefully to Rome, where Biden tries to reestablish friendships and relationships uh, that have been damaged. Biden, unlike Trump, who seems to have a real personal affinity for Eastern Europe, uh, Biden has much more of an affinity for Western Europe. He's very proud of his Irish roots. Uh, he married a woman, Dr. Biden, who uh, is Sicilian-American. Her, her family comes from near Messina. 
And he has a history of transatlantic uh, diplomatic work. He's somebody who's deeply committed to NATO. So my eighth prediction is that depending on who wins, we will see a much a dramatically, a dramatically different orientation between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Number nine, my final prediction before we turn things back over to the group and to, to Massimo Bergami to, to direct things a little bit, is this is a great opportunity for Europe in a weird way. You might see the diminished standing of the United States in the world. You might see the difficulty that the United States is having as something that presents difficulty for Europe because the United States so often plays a role helping to form our alliances and lead our alliances. Uh, but I think that amidst the political division in the United States, this really presents an opportunity for Europe to assert its leadership. This presents an opportunity for European models of growth and governance to assert themselves. And so I think that if you're looking over the Atlantic Ocean and say, my goodness, American governance is, is damaged, you should view this as an opportunity to come together to Europe as lead and lead. Uh, so with that, I will turn things back over uh, to uh, Dean Massimo Bergami uh, and to our discussants here, and thank you for this opportunity to share my views on this election and some of, what's its, some of what its consequences are. Thank you very much, uh, Alec, uh, for uh, your speech, uh, and thank you for making also it uh, simple, uh, uh, for me at least, uh, it was very useful uh, to listen to your points, very schematic. Uh, um, now, uh, I think uh, we want to start our conversation. And, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to introduce Monica Maggioni, that does need to be introduced by me. Um, she was uh, a, a guest speaker of uh, the school of BBS uh, when um, we had a graduation, I think uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, I remember she was... Uh, chair uh, of the chair, chairwoman of RAI uh, when she came and um, I'm very pleased uh, to have her here. She will be the first discussant and um, I think uh, uh, we might also ask uh, to her uh, to um, coordinate uh, the, the, the discussion later. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Looks like it works now. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Max. It's uh, it's such a pleasure being back here to BBS. Uh, it's uh, it's always a great opportunity to talk. My only, you know, my only concern is that we are not there in person in that fantastic place. We're not there to share visions and relations. But anyway, it's it's a great pleasure. So um, before trying to share or making our discussion easier, let me just make a couple of remarks. Uh, very difficult to talk after Alec, very complicated, but let me just add a couple of things. Uh, seen from a reporter perspective or from the perspective of someone who has been living uh, in the States, around all these states with their different approaches to life politics relations so there's something that uh, what is going on these days and these hours is telling us and it's uh, that uh, we need to understand a little more what's going on in american society which is not maybe so different from what is going on in our society uh, Max, let me just know if you want me to continue in English or Italian because that was not clear. So I don't know which is the best way to do that. So please let me know which it. language. 
I, I do. I do believe uh, you can go either way. Uh, also, I, I, I think uh, there are some uh, um, problems with the audio because uh, I'm receiving uh, a lot of messages uh, from the okay. audience saying so that you that want that, to continue. Okay, uh, maybe we can uh, we can handle it to Presidente Prodi, and I'm trying to fix my sound here. But they no no I think it is a problem uh, is a problem uh, a general problem because they don't hear me they don't hear you while uh, we can hear each other. But this is okay. Basically, it's, it's just among us. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so yes. shall I try uh, to Alec, continue? Alec, uh, you are in the room. Can you? Yeah, you can hear us. Yeah, I hear could you, you both. Tell, okay, could you tell? Could you tell I heard. Could you tell? To I the heard AV Alex Could you tell to the AV technicians that uh, the audience, the people that are connected to the platform, they don't hear us? Okay. Um, Anapia. Thank you. Anapia, Max just asked me to convey to them that people on the platform are not able to hear them. Okay. Okay, so. Okay. Il problema è con uh, Max e Magione, quindi forse passiamo la parola al uh, presidente Prodi o qualcun altro. E con Perfetto, voi due, con, e, con, allora... e, e con Monica e con e Max, mi hanno detto. Ok. Ok, io okay. cerco di cambiare device e intanto diamo certamente la parola al presidente Prodi. Ma uh, prima di tutto la lingua. Uh, se tutti parlano italiano, perché non parlare italiano? Io non lo so. I, I try to speak italiano, parli in italiano. Two minutes to demonstrate that I speak English, but I do think that uh, <laughs> Romano is more Romano <laughs> really for students. Bene, we, allora, we have, we have MBA saluti MBA a tutti, students, ma Romano. specialmente Romano. a Monica. We have MBA students, we have MBA students connected both uh, students uh, that are uh, taking the course now that uh, started yesterday and today they had to go online and uh, alumni so maybe we can go a little bit in english also uh, for that yeah, yeah. no problem for that but you have simply to order you are the boss <laughs> <laughs> look look uh, first of all greetings to everybody but to monica and his more than anybody else uh, no uh, i was charmed by by alex speech and i do share um, i think everything you know he told um, i am not so sure that uh, in case uh, of trump uh, the antitrust will be so so severe but anyway this this is a nuance you know because uh, we will be partisan but not a general uh, antitrust, uh, antitrust, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I, I do agree. But my first observation is more general. Let's say democracy. Look, in the last period of time, I was analyzing uh, the going back of democracy in many places of the world, you know, and my special attention was about uh, many African leaders that in the end of their mandate they didn't want to go home. But I should have never imagined that this could happen in the biggest democracy in the world. You know, because uh, I was putting this in the list of African countries, but not uh, <laughs> concerning the United States. You know, this is my real surprise and the message democracies are giving in this period of difficult for democracy is very very damaging we have to end uh, alec we have to end very soon this this fighting because it destroys our possibility of leadership our possibility of leadership you know the chinese the Chinese point of view is, look, you don't deliver, you fight each other, you are not uh, united, never. We do that. And if this happens in Italy, look, it's not so important. 
But if this happens in, inside the United States, this could change the future of the world. What I mean, the United States strength is not because of uh, uh, hard power only, but because of soft power. And uh, uh, we, we, we cannot damage our soft power now, you know, because we are already too weak uh, to damage it. You know? This is my first, uh, first uh, uh, let's say, objection to, 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 to what, we are, what we are assisting in, this, uh, in these days. Imagine what, what the, uh, the Chinese leader will say, you know, uh, to the Africans. You want to imitate them? You want to imitate them? Really? Hmm. No. We attract. We are uh, the, the, the magnet of the world, you know. This is my really uh, most, uh, uh, let's say, dramatic uh, thinking. Uh, for the other point, I, I, I share what uh, Alec told, uh, especially mm, and the change about Europe. Uh, I am sure Biden. I, I try to to, to 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 read what he told in the past. He will never try to divide Europe. He will never try to divide Europe. Uh, he will never insult the German Chancellor. And uh, so we have. Uh, well, uh, will not be easy for him, even for him to renovate NATO because uh, we have to be honest uh, not only with uh, with uh, uh, trump but also with obama uh, who, after the, the for the berlin wall we don't understand what nato uh, wants to be in the next 10 or 20 years you know it's uh, and so uh, this would be a problem now hot because of turkey because uh, this uh, is, uh, is clashing on the Middle East, you know. And uh, mm, uh, look, uh, a point that, uh, that Alec has not uh, touched uh, uh, is uh, uh, the Middle East policy or uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the role of uh, uh, foreign American policy in the world. Uh, even in this case, I don't think that uh, there will be enormous change. Let's say uh, uh, um, Biden, in any case, will go on with uh, the idea of uh, the last uh, two American presidents to avoid at any cost any military commitment outside the United States. And this is also important to take note about it, you know. Uh, so we cannot expect uh, uh, interest in Libya or an increasing interest in the Middle East, you know. Uh, clearly, uh, the link with Israel uh, will uh, is an exception to, 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 to what I'm telling now. Uh, but uh, uh, the... Uh, global American foreign policy is over for everybody for the time being, I think, you know. Uh, on the, uh, on the uh, economy, uh, there, there is, a, uh, there is a, a deep uh, question mark concerning uh, the scientific policy. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, American fantastic progress in the last years has been uh, due also to the contribution of uh, all the scholars, students uh, going to U.S. on the openness of, of America. And in the last two years, this uh, uh, process is decreasing so much. I do think that this is the biggest danger for the future of the United States. And in this uh, field, uh, the uh, two present policy is different, at least in, in, in what happened in the last, in the last, two, in the last two years. So um, uh, these are 
my objections to the points raised uh, raised uh, by by Alec. But uh, all others are, uh, I do agree. Also, when he <laughs> touches the point of uh, a Green uh, New Deal, also because uh, the Green New Deal uh, that Europe is is the main point of Europe, and I like it, and I'm backing it. But when we go to the costs, I am an industrial economist the costs are so high for this new policy that if we don't have some sort of uh, global agreement with China to and so on and so on, it will be very difficult to have any substantial change in this field. We are making a, a hymn to uh, wind, to solar, but when we see the concrete results with a lot of cost in the last years in Europe, we understand that we cannot uh, keep the engagement that we have solemnly taken. That I, 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 I repeat, we must work in this direction, but if we don't uh, uh, include others, it uh, will be a problem. And, uh, let us not uh, forget that in this moment uh, dozens of uh, coal uh, electrical uh, power stations are in uh, under construction in china and even more in asia uh, by chinese uh, companies so <laughs> look we cannot, without breaking all the uh, all the global economy, uh, we don't do it. Last point: uh, the uh, uh, the multinational agreement. Let's say uh, Trump uh, uh, has, is going out of any uh, international engagement uh, of many of them, you know, concerning uh, the. Uh, the legislation for the C, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, WTO, and so on and so on. Uh, clearly, uh, Biden cannot reverse this policy in one shot, but at least UNESCO, at least uh, Health Organization, you know, will. Uh, Will uh, will be uh, will come in not only the Paris uh, Agreement with all the research I had done before, but uh, all the international uh, links. Uh, uh, you know, is not uh, uh, for for Biden. Uh, American first uh, is not America alone. And so we'll be America first, but with somebody else. And so last, last point, really. Uh, and the problem of the relation with Europe uh, is important for the US, also for the military point of view. Because uh, I think that uh, to um, insulate Europe, uh, to uh, divide uh, um, many of alliance and uh, only keep uh, take care of the countries around China, you know, having only a Pacific uh, foreign policy. Let's say Vietnam, Japan, Taiwan is not sufficient for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a global, a global foreign policy you know so this is another uh, change that uh, i i uh, that i do i do expect uh, even if <laughs> i i i don't want to be paradoxical even if i do think that uh, the economic solidarity in europe was heavily helped by the fear of uh, no of the uh, and uh, of American friendship uh, by uh, Trump, you know. I think that uh, uh, Brexit uh, 
and uh, the American uh, policy have, uh, uh, you know, have uh, told to Germany, you Germany, you cannot stay alone in the new world global uh, challenge. And so uh, Germany changed it also because of, uh, of uh, the American hostility. I think that this change will go on but it is an absurdity. But I do think that uh, Trump policy helped, <laughs> as it happens sometimes in history, helped the European unity in the last months. Thank you for those words, President Prodi. Uh, I think we're trying to hear Monica Mojoni. Is she coming through? Not yet, so they're asking me. Should I continue? Uh, Monica, try to turn on your microphone. They're saying your microphone is turned off. She's saying it's on. They are saying it is off. There we go. I hear something. There you go. Oh, God. Okay, it says... Okay, why don't we turn to Mr. Napolitano at this point? I'm particularly interested. So let me say one thing in, in, in bringing you into this conversation. First of all, I hope you, you, dis you found some things to disagree with me on. I say when two people agree about everything, only one person's doing the thinking and um, so I do hope that you'll t that with your remarks you'll find something maybe to take maybe to you know push back against the Obama Democrat that I am with my analysis but I'd be interested in your take on all of this with a particular eye on the economic dimensions well you know first of all thank you for uh, having me here and uh the reason why I'm here, as in America, uh, would, uh, somebody would say there is never a second chance to the first impression. And the first impression <laughs> I get during our friendship is that I am a Republican, though an Italian. Uh, the, um, the, uh, you know, and so stereotypes abound about uh, starting from the fact that, as you know, in the United States, as long as we talk about fashion, food, furniture, and school cars, we're number one. As long as we move away from those, we uh, start to be the lagger again. And, and, and this is uh, this is unfortunately, despite all the romantic law between the United States and Italy, uh, we're still uh, not having a serious business relationship as far as foreign direct investments is concerned, and as uh, uh, you know, also in terms of export. So. Um, so the uh, I am supposed to be the Trump guy, and I have to, to be very frank. I'm not. Uh, if I were, if I were an American, and I'm not, uh, I would have been in deep trouble for these elections. Uh, uh, probably in Italy, we are used to too many, way too many options. Uh, but uh, I would have been in serious trouble in picking one of the two. So I'm glad I'm not. Uh, so, uh, having said that, uh, uh, you know, I, I went through your points, and I think there are a number of things. Uh, first of all, probably you mentioned that there have been some issues. You know, I think that where they won't change is China. I think that on China, there has been a bipartisan uh, uh, support in the relationship with China. And I think uh, that China, among other things, has been uh, a strategic historical mistake. Uh, to bring it way too early into the WTO under the assumption that we would have uh, uh, westernized uh, 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 China. And the truth being uh, that today China is uh, uh, growing, is imperialistic, is, uh, is, is, is aggressive, and it, it is, the, I think, the real competitor uh, to the United States and Europe. And, and I think uh, uh, that 
the, the most important thing of the presidency, the Trump presidency, is that it has been the most consequential uh, presidency, uh, at least in my lifetime. Uh, uh, Trump has done a number of things that have delivered today a different world vis-a-vis -vis what we had four years ago. So he uh, smashed the uh, nuclear accord with Iran. He pulled out from the Paris Accord. He uh, 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 destroyed the relationship with NATO, uh, and and uh, he uh, you know he went on uh, supporting uh, uh, or trying to have a better relationship with dictatorships. As you mentioned earlier, uh, the the World Health Organization, you know, his trust in the UN is minimal. So today, and this is not a judgment, we are managing a different world, and I think the most uh, 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 dangerous thing that he has done. He has tarnished American credibility. What has happened in, in the uh, Middle East, and especially with the Kurds, it's something that cannot be restored in six months. Uh, predictability and trust, as you know, is the number one thing in any kind of relationship. And after what has happened, I think uh, we are going to uh, face in any case a different America. Now, for this discussion and the election, I, I see two things. The domestic policy, and I believe that the United States is in itself resilient, even though there are a number of things that might happen in the next uh, 76 days. But the United States is, as we all know, the oldest democracy. It's a federal state, even though the Supreme Court today is six to three. Uh, there, there should be no misunderstanding that judges appointed by Trump will not do lip service to Trump. Uh, on, on any issue, they will try to establish their reputation because they take care of their legacy. And of course, on ethical issues, uh, there might be differences, but, but I think that the United States is a very solid system. The military, I think, uncompromisingly took the distance from the president. So even though we're going to have here and there, and that's, I think, it's the salt of democracy, I trust that everything will go not as smoothly as we all have liked, but I think it'll go through. Comes January 20th, we're going to have, uh, you know, a new president. So that's, you know, I'm not concerned about domestic policy. Yes, one to three trillion dollars. You got a huge issue about the American dream. Uh, you got an issue on the quality of employment because before COVID, you had a very low unemployment rate, but the quality of the employment was very low, so that you had to have two or three shifts for people to make it at the end of the month. So uh, I agree with you. Inequality, it's a big issue. Where I am, in, uh, on the other hand, very uh, you know optimistic is, as we discussed earlier before uh, we, we started this conversation, it's about Europe, in fact. I think Europe will be defined by the crisis that it will be able to manage, face, and shape. And I think this is a unique opportunity for us uh, to get out of the wake of the United States uh, with all the due respect. You know, here comes a guy who has been studying between the uh, NYU, Harvard Business School, and Hampton. You know, my life and career has been what it is because of the United States, but I am deeply, and uh, you know, uh, first of all, a Neapolitan, where I'm from, then Italian, and then European. So my root. <laughs> Uh, are are where they are, and uh, and I, uh, since we have many MBAs and young students, I think that Europe is the America of the future. There is so much that we need to do on uh, that. I hope that we'll be able to draw and 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 retain talents. I think that Europe has two major things to do. One thing is we need to create not only and one market on. That we have my market on services we need to create scale and scope of of companies and we have done that in the past you know airbus could be uh, uh you know a brilliant example as you know beginning of the mobile industry we were in europe the absolute leader with gsm which by the way stands for group special mobile the other thing is is as professor uh, prodi and the president prodi mentioned it's military uh, I don't think uh, uh, that, you know, uh, being Trump or Biden, uh, you know, NATO is, is, uh, 
is, is something that, that will be enough for the future. We need to have and start to be together on the continent, especially after Brexit, on the military side. I know this creates a lot of issues on, because you know we have these Arcobaleno things, peace and love for all, but if we want to really be competitor and friends, <laughs> we gotta get out from the wake. Of, of the United States and thinking about it. By the way, a person which is, cannot be, uh, 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 you know, a cold a Trumpist, which is uh, uh, our former Prime Minister Giuliano Amato, he had some issues about the NATO strategy in provoking Russia so much and so soon, uh, so that we pushed away. Uh, uh, and he would say uh, that, you know, Trump, uh, Putin, could be a cent or a navel, depends how you manage it, and probably we have not managed it well. So I think on the military side, we have a lot of things to say. We have an atomic bomb, which are, which is the French, the French one. They not will not be ready to share with us immediately, but it, but it's an asset. And after Brexit, as you mentioned, I believe Come that we Italians are the best candidates to fill that gap in terms of a good relationship with the United States for a number of, of, uh, of historical reasons. So, I, you know, to your last point about the opportunity for you, but I do agree with you. Uh, I think that China remains a, a difficult client uh, for everybody. Uh, still today, I, I don't understand why if you have a picture with the president of China, you're a cool guy. And if you got a picture with Putin, that guy. I mean, it, that, 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 that escapes my, my rational understanding because both are not leaders of democracy. And by the way, Mr. Putin with Medvedev and the, the, the Constitution back and forth, he has tried to do, you know, a, a bit of, uh, of uh, as we say, there is a, a very nice uh, cake in Naples, which is called pastiera. He has tried to do something like that so that he could, uh, you know, sweeten the Western observers. So... I think that with, with, with China, we need to go back in tandem with the, with the United States in order to face, to face our future. And about Italy, I am so glad that my, my friend uh, Max uh, you know, is hosting this in English. I think the time is ripe that Italy, uh, you know, and I take also the opportunity to have Monica Maggioni on board, you know, we need to start to speak in English to the rest of the world. As you know, we do not have anything, you know, last week or two weeks ago, a very important British magazine had this article about the dawn of Italy going back to the Gattopardo and everything, abstracting things. So we, don't, we do not own our narrative. And in the new scenario, it's going to be disruptive, irrelevant from Trump on Biden. We need to step up. As Max knows, we have done a little thing. We have launched uh, this voice of business, which is, you know, the first attempt to have a voice in English from Italy online. For those that are interested, there are today about 130 interviews with Italian and European thought leaders and Americans in English, and it's dedicated to the international community so that we start to propose an Italy which is not necessarily the Italy of the food, the fashion, and the good things, which, by the way, are great. But just one data point, talking about the United States, Americans buy much more pills from Italy than they do food and wine combined. They buy pharmaceuticals in the order of $8 billion a year and 3.8 of the other two. So we are indeed a high-tech uh, country, and so I think we, we, we have a say. So I, you know, uh, Alec, uh, I, I generally tend to agree with, with your, your, your four points. Uh, on the fifth, on the energy side, I think, again, that Europe has a lot to say and could take the lead. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, the uh, largest Italian company by market cap is a, a utility company, which is called Enel, and is the largest in Europe. Uh, and it is unquestionably, I think, a leader in the uh, uh, energy transition and climate change. And by the way, is the number one or number two a foreign investor in the United States in terms of renewables. So I think we have, we have all the assets since we, we have, a, I think, a pretty good audience of young people. Europe is the place to stay. And let me uh, uh, finish there with a little anecdote since I have 
the honor of having uh, a, a, a Romano Prodi on the other side of the wires, so to speak. When I graduated from my master at NYU, I went home one night, and, and this was back, you know, way back, last century. And I received a letter from the chairman of IRI. He was, at the time, the chairman of IRI, and he said, we're very glad you're graduating. Please consider us, and he lists the number of opportunities, because we want you back. Now, <laughs> this today gives me goosebumps, because that was the best rewarding thanks I ever had in my life. And I treasured that letter, and, and that was an inspiration. You know, one way or another, I'm trying to comply with that. But this is the spirit with, with whom we had to face this new era. United States is a great friends, but great friends need likewise other great friends. And so my little job, not being a Trumpist as Max would like me to be, uh, I am working for Europe, working for Italy, and hopefully, you know, one day we can marshal together for the values that we share, because seriously, the world does need us in this moment because the retrenchment of Obama started it and accelerated in his own term, tweet like by Trump is not a good news. We have to find a way to fill those gaps. So uh, uh, thank you again for having me, uh, Alec. Uh, nice, nice to meet you. And uh, thank you again for being in Italy. And I hope that we can interview you soon. And I'm sure that Bologna will take care, good care of you. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Napolitano, for that intervention. And I love the anecdote about the letter from Romano Prodi. Sempre in gamba, Romano Prodi. He never misses a step, never. Um, so I understand, so a little, for those of you who worry about the machines taking over the world, who think that, you know, we're going from a world where humans are telling machines what to do, where the machines are taking control of us and the machines are going to become our overlord. For me, the best proof that we do not have to fear artificial intelligence just yet is that we can't actually always get video to work very well. And if we can't get video to work very well, then we're in no danger of the robots coming in and taking over our world. And so I say that by way of saying, apparently we've lost some of the audio of Monica Mojoni and we've lost the audio of Massimo Bergami. So, you know, for at, if I'm gonna take one positive out of this, it's that I now fear artificial intelligence a little less since, we can't, since it's difficult to make audio work. Uh, having said that, we're now gonna turn to uh, Dr. Plummer an economist, uh, to give us his perspective. One of the things, again, that I like very much about Bologna and Bologna Business School is we have a good relationship with our partner on the other side of town, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, when I was a student in, at, at l'Università di Bologna 27 anni fa, I was very poor. And uh, the Herald Tribune, cost 1,500 lira a day. And so I wanted to be able to read the Herald Tribune, but I couldn't afford it. So I would pretend to be a student of SAIS, and I would walk into the building, which I'm sure now has security, and I'd pretend to be one of the students of the SAIS campus at Bologna, and I'd go into the, um, the library in the basement where I could read the Herald Tribune every day. So, you know, my, my feelings about SAIS and Bologna are entirely positive, and I think it's a, I think this is just further testament to the, the positive relationship between our institutions, that there's a really good relationship between our dean, Max Bergami, and your leader, uh, Dr. Michael Plummer. And so thank you for joining us here, and um, I'm going to pass the parole to you. You're up, sir. Eh, però non parlerò in italiano, meglio in inglese, mi sa. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Alec. We do have security now, but I'll leave your picture at the front desk. So if you want to come in and read the Herald Tribune, uh, you should be able to do it without any problem. And uh, we're always delighted to have such close relationship with uh, the Bologna Business School and the University of Bologna. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, we were founded uh, 65 years ago, and when we started, we were actually guests at the University of Bologna mm. until 1961. 
Uh, so those, and, you know, we do a lot of joint things together. And so it's a, it's a wonderful relationship. I just want to make uh, a few points because I've enjoyed all of the comments that have made such so far. And I think Alec, you do a wonderful job of, of surveying a lot of, um, a lot of issues and, and giving some predictions that I think are, are quite logical, but I just like to make two points. First, I really do believe that you're right. The United States is a divided nation, but I think that that division has been has been fueled in a way that has really made it much, much worse. Uh, in other words, the the policy of the current administration seemed to be to divide the public into us versus them, you know, good versus evil. And this was this was a tactic, uh, you know, for going back to the Steve Bannon days uh, to do to, you know, separate out the crazy liberals from, uh, you know, from the uh, make America great uh, again people. And I think that that has had the effect of leading to such alienation because, as you mentioned, the president of the United States is powerful, not because just because of the levers, the policy levers uh, that the president has, but also as a, a symbol of the country. And if you've got this very important person who is fanning some of these flames, uh, it can lead us to where we're at. So I think that if we have, if uh, Joe Biden were to win, I think that uh, it may take a little while, but I think things will calm down quite a bit and these divisions can be healed. Uh, and so things will be a, a little bit uh, less uh, crazy uh, as they seem to be these days. Secondly, I, I guess I would add to one of your, uh, your points, a problem having to do with debt. Now, uh, you'd mentioned that the stock market has been something that President Trump has measured his success on, and I, I would agree with that. But what we saw with when the Trump administration came in was a huge fiscal expansion at a time we were already approaching full employment, as economists would say it. And you had a huge cut in taxes and uh, a, an increase in expenditures to the point that even before COVID hit in the first half of uh, twenty. Uh, 19, we saw a, uh, a record deficit. We had uh, already in the first half, just for a half, $780 billion deficit. Then we had COVID, which is going to lead to, by the end of the day, let's face it, we're going to have $4 trillion of debt hangover. Now, let's assume that we have a Biden administration that comes in I, who wants to do things. I think that the uh, Republican Party, uh, which, as you mentioned, will probably... Uh, uh, control the Senate, will be antagonistic to any increasing spending. And while that might seem to be folly, I think that that's what history shows us. When you would know better than anyone watching uh, what happened when President Obama inherited the worst economy in 75 years and had to fight for his life to get a very, very small stimulus package because the Republicans, when they're out of office, are fiscally conservative. Uh, when they're in office, they spend like drunken sailors, and this is the problem we're at. So what you're going to see is, my, you know, the problem that I see coming is that once we get this new government installed, you know, after six months, you're going to have uh, the Republicans becoming once again fiscally virtuous and are going to be arguing that we need to cut spending and preventing from the government from doing anything new, like some of these energy policies that you're mentioning. Um, and this is going to be a, you know, a problem for the economy that needs to heal. And eventually we're going to have to do uh, something with that debt. Uh, you're absolutely right. You've got monetary policy that is essentially, you know, monetizing that debt. Uh, you know, how long that can be done for? I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge economic experiment. I don't, um, I am pessimistic as to how that is going to end. And so I think that that economic policy itself will be a big battleground uh, in over the next four years, if if Biden wins the election, if Trump wins the election, eventually um, something at some point, uh, the debt problem is going to be have to be handled. But I think that once again, that the, the uh, administration will try to pass it on because we've seen these big, huge increases in debt tend to be uh, during uh, Republican presidencies. So let me just let me just stop there. questions from some of our MBA students. I don't know if Mr. Napolitano is still available, but I'd, I'd love to hear from, I'd love to hear from um, Romano Pro, Prodi and, and perhaps Mr. Napolitano if he's available. Um, but one of the questions that came in from the students was that regardless of whether Trump wins or whether um, 
Biden wins, relationships betwe between the United States and China are not necessarily going to be good. What strategy should, Ch should Italy's businesses take to navigate between the United States and China, or should it not navigate? Should it align with one or the other? Could, could you please respond to that first, uh, Presidente Prodi, and then Mr. Napolitano, um, and this is from one of our uh, MBA students. Well, uh, the, uh, all Europe will navigate for, for trade necessity. There is no choice. The probe is to navigate together if we navigate together, we preserve the NATO, the alliance, you know, the traditional alliance, and we can do our business, you know, as we do. But look, uh, the navigation is uh, necessary also for the United States. Mm. Uh, there will be hostility to China. Totally, uh, I, I share that uh, Republican and Democrats will do the same policy, but don't forget that in the last two years, American investment in China increased. And the tensions move it from trade to technology, and there is tension and will be an enormous tension in all the fields concerning security, defense, etc. But when you have 40% of Chinese exports that are generated by multinational companies, mainly American, you push the hostility to some point. And so my point is general hostility vis-a-vis -vis China, but everybody will navigate in some way in the business area as has been done till now. Thank you. Mr. Napolitano, how does Italy navigate between ever escalating tensions between the US and China, or should it not try to navigate it? What's your perspective on this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, let me say that, you know, China is a difficult client, but it's a client. So you, you have to keep that client. Uh, and and uh, unless you want to go to war, which is not my idea, even again, if if Max would love me to do that as, as a Trumpist, but but it's uh, it's something that we can uh, navigate or lead as long as we have a strategy. I think we're facing a, a dilemma in 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 the Western world, and the dilemma is as follows. As uh, President Prodi was mentioning, corporations have increased their investment in China for obvious reasons. They want to provide their investor with returns. And there is no way you can provide those returns without China for a number of reasons that to our MBA students are very well known. On the other hand, the caliber of human capital that sits on the corporate side is not reflect, reflected in the public sector. So what I'm saying is that in order to lead this, you need to have capabilities at policy making level. I do not see, and that's the weak point of the West, anywhere in the Western world, a, a political leadership that is up to the job and to the task. Talking about our continent, we all hail Angela Merkel, Yes, yeah, she has done very well, but we are comparing her to the level of capability, which is probably in our recorded history, minimal. So what I'm saying is that the real challenge is how politics can go back into the leading position to intermediate between the need of the capital to give return and the well-being, peace and prosperity with with a china that again is not a democracy so you they're sitting in 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 the, in the grotto at uh, in bologna i'm sure that if you have going to have judicial trouble despite our reputation you might better work better off in italy than you would be in china so 
the 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 my answer to the question is that we are going to navigate uh, awaiting for a major leadership in terms of policy making that can help us lead and not follow the blackmail let's put it the way it is that china has vis-a-vis uh, -vis the west both in terms of investments the silk road and the fact that uh, china is the largest creditor to many of the western countries so that's why you know managing a business it's complicated but easy the largest corporation can have a hundred thousand employees when you're managing about a billion people and that's what pretty much it's us plus europe uh, plus the united states it's a different ball game so i hope that you know in the next few years we can have this transfer of know-how and capabilities because the policy level is what is missing thank you thank you and then we're at 7 30 but we got a great question from another great question from one of our mba students and the way i want to conclude this is i'd love for all of us to to answer this final question i wish we could hear monica on this because i would have loved to have heard her perspective but maybe i'll we'll bring her on in another opportunity for this um, moving around first with Dr. Plummer, then uh, Mr. Napolitano, then Presidente Prodi, among the discussants, we'll have you conclude with the three, and then I'll give my own perspective on this question. It's an interesting question. It said, you know, among the final presidential contenders was Donald Trump, uh, a white man in his mid-70s, uh, Joe Biden, a white man in his late 70s, and Bernie Sanders, a white man in his 70s. What, are the, what will it take for the next generation of political leaders to break through? That was the first part. What will it take for them to break through? And what will the attributes of the next generation of really good leaders be? So let's go, let's go in, sort of in the direction of the clock here. So Dr. Plummer, Mr. Napolitano, Presidente Prodi, and then I'll conclude it with an answer. So, so Dr. Plummer, you work with students. Again, to restate the question, the last three presidential contenders were three white men in their 70s. Um, what is it going to take for a different generation and a different type of political to, uh, leader to break through and to help bring people together? That is, an ex that is an excellent question. Um, I think the short answer would be time. Mm -hmm. I think that what we will see is, if you look at the, demo the demography of the United States is changing very rapidly. Uh, and uh, I think the system uh, of, you know, the political system is going to be changing with it. And I think over time, you're going to see much more diversity uh, at the top. And, uh, you know, obviously we do have uh, one of the vice presidential candidates uh, is not a white male, and I think that could be that will be something uh, in the future. And um, but but you're right; it is uh, it, it it seems to be the last throw, I think, for these these uh, older older white males that we see. And you know what the attributes will be? I, I'm that too is a great question, and I would love to see. Uh, a much stronger background in economics and the president's coming into office, but uh, that is not something that's going to happen. And, and what I, my fear is that it really is being a good marketer seems to be very, uh, uh, a very important attribute these days, you know, how to work with the social media and everything. I think that uh, whatever anyone says about President Trump, I don't think anybody would dispute the fact that he is brilliant in terms of marketing uh, and in using sp social media. Um, and so I think in the future, uh, that person is also going to be, have to be savvy on these new, uh, on these new platforms uh, a, as well. Uh, and, you know, things are changing so rapidly, I, I don't know where that ends, uh, but uh, I, I think that's going to be an important attribute as well. So one I hope to happen, the other uh, I think will be necessary. Very good. Mr. Napolitano. Uh, uh, I myself congratulate to he or she who posed the question because I think it's at the heart of the problem. Uh, uh, let, let's start with a, with a clear understanding without hiding, hiding ourselves behind a finger. The, 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 real, the, the understanding is that this is the first globalization in the history of a human being 
that is done in the rule of law. Uh, we have had 30 years worth of growth without any war, at least in between uh, the contents we're talking about and any war that we have had has been marginal to the business. The implication of this is that there has been no uh, history uh, where human capital has been attracted by the private sector in masses. Uh, where I, when I go to universities or any gathering and I ask who's going to join the public service, no hands goes up. And, mm. and, and the reason why, yeah, I know you're hurt and, and I'm, mm. I'm going to come back to you, uh, is, and the reason is that the value proposition of the private sector of the last 30 years has been incredibly attractive. And now we have this imbalance whereby these wonderful human beings have created globalization and the value chains, which are technology intensive and complicated. And in the Western world, on the public sector, we have people that have remained at the margins. And every time you need to have a policy, there is a tweet about it. And this is not only President Trump. The tweet is, is a disease that has permeated the political sector. So how do we get out from here? Let me, let me uh, go back to an example which I'm sure Professor Prodi can elaborate. But there was a time in this country, Italy, where we had a lot of troubles, probably worse than we were faced with. And there was a guy who was called Ciampi, who did a one simple thing. He hired the best and the brightest in one economic uh, minister at the time because he knew very well that without human capital, you could not turn around the country. One of those uh, high res at, at the time, which were in Italy are called chumpy boys, it's Mario Draghi. The other one is Vittorio Grilli. And I can go down and list the less famous guys. So I think the solution is when and if, and I think it's coming because of the, the, the pandemic as only ignited one major trend, a cry for competence. Mm. So any Western democracy has failed in managing what we're living through today. And this is the reason why we're going through this bleeding edge technology that we're not able to listen to Monica Maggioni, which I'd love to hear from. But this, this is a tipping point. I'm sure that there will be a leader that can inspire and hire talents because the public sector, and, I, and I'm glad you're going to be the last to answer because you're a point in case. And I'm very interested to you know what you're going to do as an adult. Hmm. President Prodi, the, what's it going to take for someone from the next generation to break through uh, and help bring the United States as an example, you don't have to constrain this to the United States, but in an election that comes down to Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, what are the attributes, what's it going to take for someone from the next generation to break through, sir? Well, first of all, a general observation that uh, I will uh, express myself in Italian. We have a say that is a biscaro um biscaro, a stupid, has no age. And uh, so I don't think that the quality of young leaders has been much better than the old leaders. Second, I do think that uh, all leaders in the United States uh, are, the leaders in the United States are old by chance because uh, um, uh, the Democrats prefer to have uh, a man of experience, a man that was totally different from uh, uh, Trump. And so they have chosen an old man, not because old. Uh, third, I agree with Napoletano. Uh, you know, <laughs> the private sector in the last uh, generation and a half, it was so rewarding in terms of... Uh, uh, let's say, money in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, also image that uh, is attracting uh, the most talented people. And so, uh, look, so many times we have the, 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 the 
at the end of it, you know, the result of this is that uh, you have uh, young leaders who are political leaders because uh, they have nothing else to do. And uh, this is the tragedy. So we have to put the public sector image higher. And this is an ethical problem. This is, I am worried of this fighting uh, in American policy in these days. Because to attract policy, we need not only money or, uh, let's say, power, but we need, uh, uh, let's say, ethical uh, change, you know. We need some sort that attracts leader. And, uh, you know, so uh, it's not a problem of age, but it's a problem of the working of democracy. This is, uh, this is my point. Beautifully said, sir. Thank you. Um, one second, I'm going to... Okay. okay. Um, let me um, turn it to... I, I, do I understand that we were able to connect with Monica Magioni by phone? No. Okay. Monica, prova a parlare. Monica, sei in No, so I'm not afraid of the machine. So I'm going to... Answer this final question myself now. Um, so, thank you for all of your your tremendous answers to that, and thank you to the student who asked it. Here's my view. Right now, all across the generations of political leaders, but among the younger generation more than anybody else, they're playing identity politics. Are you tall? Are you short? Are you white? Are you black? Are you brown? Are you gay? Are you straight? Are you? It's all identity politics. And it is making our politics more tribal. We are, it's like we're going back thousands of years where everything within 200 yards was a tribe and you fought between the tribes. But we're now doing it on a national scale of 330 million people. And so for all of the, you know, these new political movements that are emerging right now, where oftentimes they are embracing the language of diversity, what they are in fact doing is they are dividing and they are putting us into each little tribes and we are fighting between each other in almost tribal ways. And so I think that the leaders who emerge from the next generation will choose to see that which we have in common as opposed to that which makes us different. And I think social media plays a very negative role in this, where if you say something a little wrong or you don't agree with somebody exactly, you throw the spears at them, you destroy them. So this is, it's, it's created this sort of pure, this almost tribal purism in, the, in our politics. And it, frankly, it's worse in the next generation in the next generation than among any others. And so there are lots of young people who are listening in. And, and what I hope is that, that in these moments of real division, you, whether you're going into business, whether you're going into government, whether you're going into the NGO sector, when you think about building a team, when you think about building a partnership, when you think about building a brand, instead of just thinking about how you're different than everybody else. Think about how, what the connections are between you and those others. I think that, you know, the politics of the last decade has, has really been about blowing up bridges. And I think that the politics that we need from the next generation, need, we need some bridge builders. Uh, and so with that, let me conclude our, our session to, today together. Let me thank uh, all of our participants. Um, Monica Magioni, Michael Plummer, Mr. Napolitano, Presidente Prodi. Let me particularly thank Massimo Bergami for his role, uh, always positioning uh, Bologna Business School for what's next. Uh, you know, this was originally supposed to be an in-person session. We were going to have a lot of people. We, you know, we have these, we have tremendous infrastructure in Bologna. We can get thousands of people into a room and, you know, be able to connect and engage and in person. Even for this, even for this session today, you know, as of two days ago, we were going to do it in front of a classroom of students. But we don't have that kind of control anymore. Um, 
you know, facing a pandemic, we all have to adjust. And so, Max, I give you an enormous amount of credit. I give a lot of credit to my colleagues here at Bologna Business School who have been willing to say, oh, well, we need to cancel. We can't do it. Rather, they're saying, how do we pivot? We can pivot very quickly. And that comes with a really open mind. And so I thank you, Max. I thank uh, the, the folks who I'm looking at from Bologna Business School. And I really want to thank uh, those of you who have listened in. It's not as fun sometimes to look at an iPad or look at a computer screen and listen to people when they're sometimes a mistake, you know, where there's sometimes problems with the audio, sometimes problems with the visual. But I think it's a testament to you who choose to care about learning where you say in this moment of pandemic, you're not gonna stop your learning just because it's not as enjoyable as it is to go into a beautiful grotto or go into a, a beautiful aula at l'Università di Bologna to listen and learn and get to walk up and meet the, meet the people. Uh, don't lose hope, don't lose faith. We will get those days back, we will. Hopefully it'll be sooner than later. And in the meantime, thank you for engaging with us in this digital world. Thank you again to my fellow co-panelists. Uh, it's an honor to share the screen with you. Uh, buona serata a tutti. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, Alec. Grazie, Grazie a tutti. Grazie anche a Monica, che non è riuscita a, a, a partecipare. Adesso vedo che non c'è più, però... Grazie a tutti. Ciao, Fernando. Ci vedremo Grazie. prima o poi. Ciao, Mike. Ciao. Okay, are we off?